Hello, and welcome to The World in the Whale with Rebecca Giggs and Nick Pienson, presented by the Virginia Festival of the Book in partnership with the 1455 Literary Arts Summer Festival. I'm Sarah Lawson, Associate Director of the Virginia Center for the Book, a program of Virginia Humanities. Thanks for joining us. A couple notes before I hand the program over to our speakers. First, please share your questions using the Q&A tab on Zoom. Also, this event has optional closed captioning, which you can turn on and customize at the bottom of your Zoom window. If you haven't already read today's books, we hope you will. For details about how to buy them from a local bookseller or check on copies from your library, please visit vabook.org, where you can also explore our upcoming schedule and watch past events. While you're there, please consider making a donation to support the festival's ongoing work at vabook.org slash give. Now, I'm pleased to introduce today's speakers. Rebecca Giggs, author of Fathoms, is from Perth, Australia. Her nonfiction has appeared in The Atlantic, Granta, and Best Australian Essays, among other publications. Her writing focuses on our connection to animals in a time of technological change and ecological crisis. Fathoms is her debut book and was winner of the 2020 Andrew Carnegie Mellon for Excellence in Nonfiction, a finalist for the 2020 Kirkus Prize for Nonfiction, and a finalist for the Penn E.O. Wilson Literary Science Writing Award. She lives in Australia. Nick Pienson is author of Spying on Whales, co-author of the forthcoming children's book, The Whale Who Swam Through Time, and the curator of fossil marine mammals at the Smithsonian Institution's National Museum of Natural History in Washington, DC. Along with the highest research awards from the Smithsonian, he has also received a presidential early career award for scientists and engineers from the Obama White House. He lives with his family in Maryland. Rebecca, Nick, join us on screen. And we are excited to hear much more about whales tonight. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for the introduction. And I'm really happy to uh, be here. Um, I'm actually in just outside of Washington, DC. And uh, it's, I think it's appropriate to do the, the land acknowledgments too. So um, I think the, the, the best land acknowledgement I can find here is that uh, I should be acknowledging the traditional ter territory of the Natchitank and contemporary Piscataway people and uh, honor all indigenous communities past, present and future who make their home here, uh, where I am just outside of uh, Washington DC in University Park, Maryland. And um, my, uh, the, my uh, colleague, my, my fellow writer who I'll be uh, interviewing is, um, in Melbourne, originally from Perth, uh, Rebecca, Rebecca Giggs. And um, I think she will do her own land acknowledgement because I would just um, not do a, a, an appropriate job otherwise. Thanks, Nick. It's so wonderful to be here with you all, um, joining you digitally from Melbourne today. We've just gone into a snap lockdown. So everybody is insulated in their homes and it's very quiet on the streets. Um, Melbourne is within the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and its name is actually Nam. So it's known by many people as Melbourne on the east coast of Australia in Victoria, but its first name is Nam. It's such a pleasure to be with you. And um, I guess we can just kind of jump into it. And um, what I would say is that um, one of the things that we we have kind of uh, had a correspondence on the side in, in anticipation of this event. And one of the there's so much to talk about, but I think that one of the best ways to frame it is that um, we both use whales as vehicles for narratives about knowledge, about knowing. And um, one of the things that really strikes me, and I have a lot of passages from your book uh, highlighted and ready to go here, Rebecca, but um, one of the things that strikes me is that uh, your, a lot, sort of the uh, premise of your book is zooming in on different parts of what we can know about whales as um, reflections of greater worlds, worlds outside of us, uh, outside, of, outside of our experience, but are still telling us about the human uh, relationship to these organisms in particular, whales. Um, we'll be talking a lot about whales today. Um, and I, so what I, I guess what I'd like to start off is, um, let's open where you open your book, which is, on uh, the coast of, I think you're in South, the narrative takes place in Southeast Australia, is that right? 
The opening preface is in Perth. Yeah. It's in Perth. Perth. Sorry. Okay. So on the West Coast. And so let's, if you would, just kind of share with us, uh, I think that's the entry point to, to wonder and mystery for you, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's sort of two ways to tell the story about the inception point for the book. And the way that I've spoken about it, uh, you know, since the hardback was released by and large has been to describe that encounter with a humpback whale on the beach in Perth, um, which took place some years ago now. Um, this yearling humpback had stranded not far from my home. A yearling is not a massive whale. It was about 11 meters long um, and it had stranded initially on a sandbar, so partially in the water, partially out. And under the superintendence of some wildlife officers, a group of the public came down and we helped kind of move it off this sandbar and back into the ocean. But several hours later, it re-stranded higher up the beach this time and more concertedly on the ground. So it seemed that it would continue to suffer and die um, uh, and it was unable to be dislodged from there. A huge crowd of people came down to see this animal. And in Perth, although um, many people from overseas may have an impression of Australia as being like very proximate to whales, like living in a whale's world, which is very true um, on the East Coast where you can stand mm -hmm. on the beach and you see breaching humpbacks during their migration daily. But on the West Coast, they tend to stay on the other side of Rottnest Island, out where the water's deeper. So you don't see them so much from the coastline. You have to actually be on a boat ordinarily to encounter them. So here was this animal that people, you know, find so bewitching. People brought down their children, they brought down their dogs on leashes, and everyone had different theories for why whales might strand. So initially I got talking to people about their versions of that story. You know, some people said to me, well, this animal is probably malnourished, it hasn't been fed well by its mother and therefore it's kind of skinny. Others thought perhaps it had something to do with plastic pollution or the activities of the Japanese scientific whaling fleet in the Southern Ocean. One person even said to me that they understood whale beachings to be connected to falling stars. Although the more we talked about it, the harder it was to locate why that might be, whether the whales were kind of drawn off course by changes in the cosmological sphere or if they confused night for day when stars started to fall. Anyhow, so I had all these theories and I was kind of interested in the ways in which they point to different understandings of causation in the natural world yeah. <clears throat> and the way we wrap kind of the death of a whale into bigger environmental stories, as you've said. But in fact, you know, the inception point for the book, another way to tell that story is to say that I was looking for a chance to talk about a global change through a kind of Trojan horse that people found they could empathize with. Because it's been my experience as somebody who cares deeply about the natural world. But when I hear about, you know, that the, the melting ice caps and the changing ozone layer, I find it so deeply disembodied and, and very um, kind of hard to latch my he head to, like hard to feel emotionally. Whereas, of course, whales are this entity that we have this long history of projecting into, considering to be like human beings in some way. Um, and I felt like there was this sort of uncanny boundary between familiarity and strangeness mm -hmm. that I could leverage to get people involved in a bigger environmental story. Right. You, you speak about this really well uh, in the earlier chapters of the book, and I'm going to read from from it. Um, and this is, you are talking about weaving several threads at once here. Uh, and you're talking about the meaning of the whale. Uh, and you, you've just talked about the whale fall in particular, which is just a beautiful passage describing uh, the whole process by which uh, a whale dies natural death at sea, or even sometimes unnatural, uh, the hand of human um, a causation. And uh, that carcass falls down through the water column, ending up on the sea floor and in which it takes on a second life. Uh, so you've described this all, um, but you say that the way an undersea whale fall is a death plot, it also ignites a life force. The way whales may entomb the history of human enterprise within their bodies, it simultaneously be a wellspring of wild wonder to us. Uh, so it's, 
so whales are really the the inception point, the entryway, the gateway for a lot more than just themselves. And you know, it's like you were saying with the people on the beach. People come at come at it from a lot of different um, directions, experiences, um, kind of wants uh, of of what they what they seek out of it. Um, and there's so many directions to go from there. It's almost like uh, whales in and then whales out. Um, and uh, <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. I think, I, um, sorry to interrupt, but yeah, I, I absolutely agree with that. And I think you know, part of that, like, there are lots of different intellectual ways to come yeah. at the whale as a body of knowledge, and yeah. and then there's kind of a physical kind of approach where you're sort of engaged in this act of decomposition yourself, and you're looking yeah. at like the lungs and the way that the change in the atmosphere pollution wise has affected the whale's lungs or then you you know in your book we we see the the earwax of the whale as this amazing almost like a tree ring account of the whale's environmental history contained in the wax of its ears right. so there are all these different intellectual ways in but ultimately i think you know on a slightly more cynical level I, I do believe that if you come at people on the level of their environmental conscience, you'll only ever be writing in a kind of pious way about questions that are existential in scale and kind of apocalyptic in tone. You know, these are the environment, yeah. the, the emotional temperatures of the environmental moment we're in. Whereas I want to know, you know, this sort of part of you that's drawn to stay up late watching weird videos of goblin sharks and, you know, clams that stick out their long yellow tongues and blobfish. Yeah. And actually for me, in Spying on Whales, one of the most affecting passages was this one, and perhaps you'll tell the story, but the one about the organ that you've discovered, this oh, right. kind of yeah. weird grisly organ, which I, I absolutely had that feeling of like, I can't turn away from right. the book because there's this kind of uncanny strangeness to this, this particular structure that we'd never known about inside the heads of whales. Yeah. Yeah, I was looking at past correspondence, and that's one of the things that stuck out. This was several years ago. You said that was a really weird story, and it was a it was a wild experience. And I, I think I tried to capture how, uh, for me, ultimately, you know, this is about the discovery of a new sensory organ in the in the chin of a specific group of gulp feeding whales, and how we figured that out. And for me, as a scientist, um, and as a as a as a wannabe writer. As an aspiring writer, um, I uh, I want to tell stories that explain how we know because I think it's one thing to state the discovery, but to give the background and all the work that goes into it, I think that can be really illuminating and also important for people to know. And um, for me, that whole process was was about uh, boundaries of knowledge, about ignorance. If you don't know your own, own ignorance, you won't be able to say that's something new, that's something we don't know and we need to know more about. Um, and that's, so I'll, I'm just going to hold that as our next topic, which is about the boundaries, the edges of knowledge. And uh, so the cue will be how whales show us how little we know and the many different ways. So we're going from the many different ways of knowing to how little we know. But I see in the q and um, I'm just going to read out this, this question from Katie Trombetti. Uh, in either of your books, was there a story that you wanted to tell or a piece of information you wanted to share? but was left out, uh, was on the, the cutting room floor. Didn't fit the overall narrative, too sad, et cetera. Love both your books. So, Rebecca. Thank you so much, Katie. Uh, you give me the opportunity to tell a wonderful story from the Southeast coast of Western Australia. Um, so I did a research trip down to the small town of Eden, historically a shoreside whaling town wonderful place if ever you have the chance to be on the south coast of eastern australia definitely one to visit it's got a fantastic killer whale museum at any length um the story that i tell in the book about eden is about 19th century australian whale bathers who went to whaling stations to climb inside the carcasses of dead humpback and southern right whales to have different kinds of ailments cured arthritis depression they thought that the fat and uh, elements of the whale could kind of um, cure these ailments by steaming them inside these hot bodies that they'd climb inside. Must have been fetid and horrible. 
At any length, there's another story from Eden that ended up on the cutting room floor, and it's this. Australian whalers in the late 1800s, early 1900s used killer whales the same way that British hunters used to use beagles and hounds to drive foxes towards them. They had a reciprocal relationship with pods of orca where the orca would drive larger whales, blue whales, humpbacks, southern rights, melon-headed whales into a bay and then the, hunt, the hunters would come at the whales on the other side with spears and, and um, other kinds of whaling equipment. Uh, they'd kill the larger whales and then they'd shear off the lips of the whale and the tongue and they'd feed it to individual killer whales. So it's a quite a distinct relationship. And um, there are all kinds of tall tales that spring from this history, stories of association between individual whalers and individual whales. There's in fact one whale well known there called Old Tom. Mm -hmm. who's right. in the um, and yeah, it's, it's kind of a, it's an interesting subversion of the narrative that we talk about in terms of whales as victims of whaling and whalers as perpetrators. Um, and it just didn't fit with what I wanted to say in the book more broadly. Um, and it also, there's some really, it's hard to separate myth from reality. It seems certain that that in, collaboration existed. And in some cases, I think the argument which that's made that I find very compelling is that indigenous whalers had been using that um, relationship for, for many hundreds of years prior to colonial whalers coming along and stepping into the feet of the Aboriginal whalers from the region. Um, so... But yeah, that, that's a kind of extraordinary history. And there are amazing photos of whalers, you know, out in the bay and this huge, you know, killer whales, just like, like a submarine has kind of like come out of the water, this dark head of the whale with the big fin, terrifying in fact, but there are the whalers kind of jovially sitting alongside them. Um, one whaler drowned very famously and was purportedly, his body was brought back to the shore by the orca without right. harm, you know, to be returned to his parents. Right. So it's a fascinating history. Right. But the, tell me what, what ended up on the cutting room floor for spying well, on whales? Well, I'm still like captivated by the, the Eden's, you know, Old Tom and the Whales of Eden. And I think there's several books, I've read several books about this. And each time I, it all fits into one kind of cinematic story about the this pod of killer whales. And I guess what, what I just add to that too, is that when you recognize that, killer whales live human lifetimes and sometimes longer. I think the oldest killer whales, uh, grandmother, great grandmother identified over a hundred years in Puget Sound. Uh, if that's true, then these kind of interactions are as transgenerational for humans as they are for that pot of whales. Um, and that some of these whales likely worked with generations of the same clan of human as much as humans would work with the same clans of whales. And, and that's, um, you know, there's other analogs of that elsewhere in the in the animal world, and that reminds me of some incredible passages from Carl Safina's um, book about um, uh, what animals think. And there's some just wonderful anecdotes about uh, the interactions between humans and whales. And you realize, again, going to our next peg, how little we know. Uh, there clearly is communication between these two species of very sophisticated mammals that each get something out of the collaboration. And it shouldn't, you know, we should kind of, ex for me, at least in my opinion, we should accept this evidence at face value. That is collaborative hunting across species. And if you think that's so surprising, then you've never seen dogs hunting with humans, right? Mm -hmm. So like this has happened before. Um, uh, to answer your question, Rebecca, about what I left on the cutting room floor, I left about, uh, 60,000 words on the cutting room floor. So the quick answer to that is many, many vignettes from uh, the life of a scientist in the field um, or lab bench, or in my case, the museum uh, hallways. Beyond Worlds, Beyond Words. That's the, the name of the of Carl Sakin's book. Thank you to um, uh, Sarah for posting that in the chat. Um, yeah, it's the cutting room floor that, that I lament. Uh, and it was actually, part, uh, so I'm gonna answer that question in the inverse and say that um, one of the things about learning how to write a narrative in a book length format is what to leave out. And uh, that's hard as a, as a scientist because 
as a scientist, you're kind of taught to like drill down and give as much information as possible. And if you can't fit it into the length of a scientific report, put it in the supplement or put in your, you know, see your field notes. Um, and that's really counter to what, what a good narrative is, which is giving you um, just what you need to, to be carried along. Um, so let's, you know, what I would like to move is to the, you know, a uh, little bit through our outline. Um, we were talking about the edges of knowledge and how little we know about whales. Um, I think for you, in your book, you talk, and, and this is something I, I really get out of, you know, you kind of pick up on the things that a particular author likes, the stories they like. Um, and I think for you, that has to do with whale navigation and how whales end up stranded in the beach. And uh, for Australians, especially those who live in Tasmania, this is a big deal because it turns out there are places where whales tend to strand over the scope of decades, hotspots. Um, and why they do that is, this gets at mystery. Um, and I, I don't know if you cite, I think you mentioned that example at some point, but, but this gets at the variety of knowledge and the ways that uh, all the different explanations of what we don't know. So I'll, I'll dish yeah. to you. Yeah, no, uh, well, my mother's from the Southwest of Western Australia, which is actually um, the part of Australia where the very tail end of whaling took place. Australia didn't stop whaling till 1977, was the last English speaking nation to cease commercial whaling. Um, and the last whaling station was down in Albany, which was my mother's hometown. But not far from there is a bay called Hamlin Bay, um, where only two years ago, three years ago, um, something in the order of 300 pilot whales pulled up. Um, Tasmania as well, there are a number of hotspots, hotspots there where hundreds of whales can end up stranded. And of course, you know, an event like that happens and it almost has a kind of religious connotation, you know, like here is this mass of animal life that's suddenly appeared and is, you know, to our eyes, the tragedy of the suffering is so acute. Yeah. Um, and for what reason? It, it's still such an intense mystery. Um, and there are theories, you know, that now if you read um, Ed Yong in The Atlantic had a wonderful piece where he said something like um, each whale pod strands for a different reason. It's it's kind of unhappy in its own unique way, <laughs> but it is possible. To point Dickensian. To. Uh, no, sorry. That's a quote from um, a Russia. Um... And a every, in it. Yes, every family. <laughs> yes, right. Sorry. Exactly. Go on. Um, so, you know, th these mass strandings are one thing, but the other really striking event, of course, is when a very large whale appears. And um, I got quite interested in this period in 2016 when sperm whales started uh, pulling up along the coasts of Europe. Germany, France, the UK, there was suddenly, a, you know, seemingly in an abundance of sperm whales just appeared, individual whales, but also in pairs. And because it was, um, you know, seemingly without cause, I think a lot of people were reaching for um, an answer to the question, how are we involved? Mm -hmm. Is this the result of um, right. perhaps uh, irradiated water being discharged from the Fukushima power plant after the mm -hmm. disaster there that's kind of affected the whales in some way or, is this um, an environmental reason that's triggered by anthropogenic change in the oceans? But interestingly, the theory that um, I found most compelling was actually from a journal of astrobiology, um, uh, which purported uh, to have done a series of studies looking at the ways that sperm whales navigate in the open ocean as individual animals moving through the dark, no landmarks, no sense of, you know, how one orientates oneself in that world is, is sort of magic. And they said that, uh, you know, one of the theories at the moment is that they're navigating by magnetic sea marks. Um, again, this amazing sort of sense, which is so alien to us, what it must be like right. to sense the magnetic fields. And there had been in um, 2016 a solar storm, which um, had in a very minute way slightly distorted the um, magnetic fields for a season. And so they said the strandings may well be because um, these whales are navigating alongside 
kind of almost mountains of magnetic energy. And when they've moved slightly, they've become disorientated and they think they're in deep water when in fact they're in shallow water. And this is the reason they've stranded. So, you know, this outlandish idea that was put to me on the beach initially in Perth, that whale beachings are in some way connected to the astral plane, turns out to have some kind of grounding in reality. And I think, you know, that story, to bring it back to this question of how much we don't know, you know, as a, a paleontologist and, and someone who works with bones, you you, uh, you put so wonderfully in um, uh, spying on whales, the fact that there are some species of whale we know from just like a handful of right, bones, right. like like pieces of bone that are smaller than like chess pieces. And yet they belong to these bus sized mammals. Um, yeah. The, yeah, uh, that's something I confront on a daily basis. And I remember there's a passage in your book that talks about it. And one of my notes to myself, um, this is about species of beaked whales, which are also among uh, the whales that do strand on occasion. And actually they're strandings when they show up on shore. You know, and you, we talked a bit about, um, you know, the entry points for whales. Their inaccessibility really defines how we can know them because uh, they live their lives in complex enormous environments and the only times we get at them is if they're stationary on the beach or if they um if we're able to spot them in that one percent of their time they breach or come out of the water to, um, they're not you know they breathe at the water surface so for and to know about just the numbers of species of whales on the planet um beaked whales are actually among the more species rich groups there's some 20 species the majority of which we know about from just a few specimens, including many stranded specimens. So those stranded specimens, and it does not include um, complete skeletons or complete carcasses. Um, yeah, you're talking about, um, this is a single fossil whale vertebra, but you're talking about knowledge that it's not too much different from, from this, possessing in, in one hand the entirety of human knowledge about um, in a lineage, um, a species that's around today and, and where it came from. And, mm -hmm. you know, as a paleontologist, there are many species of fossil whales for which we have tens of thousands of bones. And then, so I think that's, I, I flip that around and say like, wow, there's fossil species for which we know way more about its osteology than the living species of whales on our planet. And, you know, if you want any better example of how poorly we know about the whales on our planet. These are large mammals that are alive on planet Earth right now. We are still describing new species of whales, even as of last year. So um, where where do we end with that? I think we still have a few more species to describe. I don't, I don't know how many. Um, and that's- well, that's part They found one kind of, or found one recently, didn't they, in a few years back with a, a skeleton in a Alaskan high school that was like a mascot for the basketball team. Right. And this is a, yeah. Yeah, they did analysis on that and they were like, oh, genetically, this is not a whale that we know. <laughs> yeah, that species was actually sit, part of uh, a, um, a specimen belonging to that species had been sitting on the shelves of the Smithsonian for many years. And a lot of people right. said, that one's different. That one belongs to something yeah. different. And, you know, that's part of the great detective story that scientists undertake um, is trying to figure that out, trying to actually... Um, uh, connect the dots and gather the evidence. And sometimes the evidence is a world spanning adventure. Mm. Um, and that's, that's, um, that's kind of why we, we, we play that game. And that's part of the narrative that I, I wanted to share is how can, how that can be exciting and, um, um, a source of equal amounts of, of wonder, you know, that process of knowing for, for a scientist is, it can be, can be, um, exhilarating sometimes. Uh, and I think about that just as a side note, I might as well say it now, uh, you know, you, in Spine on Whales, one of the things I want to say was, you know, how we came to find all the fossil whales by the side of the Atacama mm -hmm. uh, Highway uh, in, a, in a fossil site in Chile called Cerro Baena. And I just brought a, a 3D print of all those fossil whales here, and it looks good on camera here, but uh, this is just a facsimile of, of the work we did created by, by 3D scanning of, of the site. Um, nearly and we 10 should years say ago. as well, these are not uh, miniature whales. That what you have there right. is a scale <laughs> scale model. Not they're not actually this big, but but they, um, you know, prehistoric uh, puppy sized whales. Unfortunately, right. have you there are yet. yeah there are limits, right? And that's one for me as a scientist. That's one of the great things about 
um, thinking, you know, asking questions about whales, they teach us a lot about the limits of biology, uh, and um, that's that's still an ongoing process. Um, let's pivot for a second to I want to get back to another thread in your book, which is this. Um, it's something really poignant that comes through, and it, it's it starts too also with. Um, what I think can be very emotional for people, and you identify this, that you were emotionally struck by seeing the whale on the beach. This was, mm -hmm. and uh, what you talk about the green dream, you're like, uh, th this, for, for euthanizing a whale, it's no trivial process, um, mm -hmm. because we actually don't really know how, that, how to do that in, in the most ethical way. And what I want to, you know, this is a story in your book about a single individual whale, but you're not just talking about one whale, you're actually talking about um, all the whales that are and their suffering. And so there's several dimensions to this, and I just want to spell them out from the individual level. Um, you talking about that emotionally in a way that that is an entry point for talking about other things. And I think at the biggest, I want to provide the other bookend, which is um, this idea of defaunation. Uh, which Brooke Jarvis has written about, and interestingly enough, is a word that now scientists have adopted in full and now use in the pages of scientific journals, including Science and Nature, where you can find articles about scientists studying biodiversity and talking about defaunation. Um, Brooke Jarvis talks about this as loss of place, but I think it goes back to your entry point, which is about loss of knowledge, loss of identity, um, that's our entry point. Do, I guess the question is, do we need to reinvent uh, a different ethic that's tied to both suffering and place? Those are those are two different things, but they're mm. united when we talk about whales. Yes, that is a very nuanced question. Um, I'll walk it back just a little bit and talk about the green dream, and then we'll yeah. briefly touch on defornation. Okay. So when I was on the beach in Perth and this humpback whale was dying over the course of several days and it wasn't a nice death this is a grisly death you know you can hear its breathing get more and more occluded um, and the animal is thrashing in the water um, the wildlife officers who were overseeing that event and seeing keeping the crowd separate from the whale um, were talking about whether or not it would be responsible to euthanize it um, so to kill a large mammal like a whale is difficult. It's not like killing a cow in an abattoir or a horse. Um, if you put a bolt through the brain, it takes a while for the heart to register it. And vice versa, if you shoot the animal in the heart, it takes a while for the brain to register it. The organs are so far apart and there's such a galaxy of them that it, it takes a long time for the body to die. Um, and so, you know, there's a humane, humane question there. Um, the other factor was a toxic toxicology question which is that if you gave the animal a barbiturate injection which they had the equipment for there a veterinary injection which has a, a green fluid and they were calling it the green dream this this um uh, to put the animal to sleep yeah. um then you would be introducing a, a chemical into the environment that if the body was not then removed from the beach and put into landfill if all the little crabs and other decomposers came and fed from the body of the whale they would be carrying that poison out into the environment more broadly so the decision was made to let nature take its course that hasn't always been the case on the east coast of australia there have been a couple of high profile wh whale euthanizations, um, most notably in Pitwater Bay. A few years ago, there was a young humpback whale, a calf um, that had been separated from its mother that had taken to suckling off yachts. Um, so it was kind of moving along, trying wow. to feed um, wow. from the underside of the, these yachts in quite a wealthy part of Sydney. And there they did decide to euthanize the whale. But when I spoke to one of the mammalologists who was responsible for doing it, he said to me, I hated to do it. I absolutely, you know, it, it broke my heart to do it. But once I'd done it, it was me who got hate mail. He was absolutely vis eviscerated in the media. Um, there was a lot of polarizing opinion around that decision. And I think that was a factor in, in this case as well in Perth. So the green dream became this kind of metaphor, I suppose, for me for balancing the interests of the animal, the question of its suffering in the wild and how much we're responsible for that suffering as against uh, you know, our responsibility to act or to withhold action. Mm. Um, 
and yeah I think it really became the way that I wanted to talk about that responsibility for wild animals today that you know we can no longer speak of sort of withholding ourselves from environments that's clearly no longer um, a sort of feasible um, action if it ever was. Um, and so we have a kind of a responsibility for thinking about the sorts of free lives that we want to ensure for those animals. There are species of whales today that are more restrained in the wild than they would ever be if they were in captivity yeah. because they've been fettered by so much fishery junk and they're carrying around cables and bits of plastic in their stomachs and um, they're, they're caught up in netting and that is a kind of confinement greater yet than being contained in a pool in a sea world yeah. um, and these things are very tragic and very hard to think about but necessary anyhow as the book progressed I also kind of began to look at this question of defornation which um, I think you know has been talked a lot about in the context of the changes in insect populations, which Brooke's wonderful writing is, is kind of focused on that insect apocalypse that we're experiencing. Um, but I wanted to take it back to the question of whaling and thinking about the fact that, you know, we didn't see the extinction of, of species during the 19th century and 20th century whaling operations, but we did see this huge movement of biomass out of the ocean. Um, and into human industrial activity. Mm. And in doing so, we triggered other kinds of ecological cascades, the death of decomposers that we probably never even knew about on the seafloor, um, and a change in the, the energetic composition of those undersea ecologies. Um, so yeah, I think thinking about, in terms of that question of a future ethic, uh, thinking no longer so much about extinction, but about the ways in which we've changed the numerousness of animals. Yeah. Um, and in doing so, you know, had an effect on the ecological function of environments. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, the, the kind of culmination of this, the, to give one more minute to this, this topic, um, is that you know, now we're coming to understand that whales are in some ways um, interlinked with the chemical composition of the atmosphere because of the ways in which their manure fertilizes the growth of plankton. And plankton are one of the most amazing oxygen emitters on the face of the planet. Um, so some people are making the argument that we need to preserve whale populations at a greater degree of numerousness, not because we're interested in, you know, keeping a kind of stable population that will prevent extinction, but because they have this flow on effect that's positive to the to carbon capture and storage and, and the atmosphere. So I increasingly think conservation ethics that are focused on the ecological function of animals rather than their charisma or their story is going to be the way things move in the future. Let's, um, let's pause there. I do want to, the next peg will be this idea of looking in the future. What what the stories that are entombed in whales tell us about the future that we'll all play a part in. Um, and I, uh, Katie Trombetti has another question. Um, and she asks, what are your favorite books about whales? And do you have a book list you would share with people who'd like to read more? Rebecca. Oh, well, that's a great question. Um, look, I loved Philip Hoare's Leviathan. That's H-O-A-R-E, Leviathan or the whale. Um, from a few years ago. Um, it is quite focused on the literary history of Wales. So there's a big swath that's on Moby Dick in the middle of that book. Um, but yeah, just a really um, poetic and personal encounter with Wales. Um, gosh, I can, I can give you kind of natural history writing more broadly. Um, but I'm this wonderful study that's behind me is not my study. Ordinarily, I have all my whale books <laughs> right in front of me. But that I, I would put I would put Philip's book foremost. How about you, Nick? Uh, well, I happen to have the book I would recommend because uh, I I've been slowly pulling uh, my library from my office back home to populate mm -hmm. my my current reading list, and that's uh, Floating Coast by oh, Beth yeah. Shiva de Muth. And um, she's a historian, environmental historian at Brown University. Uh, and this is a story about a place, about the what is now a, a water connection between Western or Eastern Russia and Western um, 
Alaska, uh, Beringia uh, was at one point in the Ice Ages emergent. And that's how we think the first Americans, so to speak, first North Americans um, came across via in a land bridge. And right now that's uh, ground zero for one of the most um, uh, productive and, and prolific um, fisheries on the planet, uh, the Bering Sea. That's where most of the US gets its seafood. Uh, if you eat salmon or any kind of whitefish or any kind of um, uh, shellfish, chances are it's coming from the Bering Sea. From And, and it's one of the best managed fisheries too on the planet. Uh, but that productivity is in large part tied to the animal populations that you see there. Whales just are one part of the floating coast. Um, and so there's these wonderful passages in there about um, bowhead whales that can live much longer than we do. Um, and um, th it's tied to not just place, but the people who live in that place as well. well. Of course, in Beringia, you have indigenous peoples who've lived there for, their cultures go back thousands of years. In some cases, those cultures are tied to uh, whaling. In other cases, those cultures are tied to fish or, or to fishing or uh, eating walruses uh, or reindeer too. So uh, it's not just about whales, it's about much more. But, but I think those, those stories about place are really powerful because you know, it gets back to this idea of defaunation, yeah, we're, um, we want to preserve diversity, but that diversity is tied to place, uh, and that's important, even for migrating animals. Um, so speaking about migration, that reminds me that, you know, one of the points you bring up is that as rapacious as industrial whaling was in the 20th century, some two to three million whales, individual whales, were killed and removed from the world's oceans and the, the effects of which on ecosystems, we still don't really understand. That's, that's a complex question. And I have colleagues who you know, understand the calculations that underpin that um, and what, what that means. Um, those species didn't go extinct. And it actually, uh, the ones that we're most worried about for extinction, and I'm gonna presage what I'm gonna get at here with endlings, um, you know, this question of how do we confront extinction in planet earth in the age of humans? Um, so whaling didn't render any species of whales extinct. Instead, what has rendered species of whales that we know extinct are entirely human activities, um, modifying river systems. Or I was just reading now today on Twitter, um, the Mexican government has, has suspended efforts to the, the few mitigation uh, efforts that would probably save the vaquita, uh, which is mm -hmm. a small species of porpoise that only lives in the Gulf of California. Uh, uh, along the west coast of uh, Mexico, um, near Baja, California. So, um, you know, we live at a time of, of endangerment for many species of whales. And I think that question, that forward-looking question, well, what are we going to accept as humans that bear some responsibility, some complicity? Mm -hmm. And that goes back to this idea of ethic. Um, are we just going to stand by while some species go extinct again? Are we going to try to... to to do what we can, and, and you're familiar with the plights, of, those plights are different depending on the different species of whales. For those who live off the coast, uh, who live in Virginia, you'll be thinking about the North Atlantic right whale, uh, for which uh, there's only a few hundred left and maybe only a hundred uh, breeding females. That's the real number to watch. And they live right alongside urban oceans of the United States that, that jeopardize their lives and lead, as you say, to much suffering. So, you know, that idea of the ethic is not just an intellectual one. It is a material one that relates to people's livelihoods. If it's tied to fishing, say, in the same waters that, that a whale species that's jeopardized may live, or you may or may be very remote. You know, these river dolphins that um, live alongside dense populations, those dense populations may be far, very far removed from your, from your life. So um, how do you confront that idea of endlings right now after having written your book? Yeah, well, I mean, you're, you're, um, this is very top of mind for me at the moment. I think um, since the Australian East Coast bushfires in 2019, mm -hmm. 2020, a lot of us have been thinking here about what it might mean to rescue a wild animal from its environment, a natural yeah. environment but increasingly capricious and um, I'm actually doing my um, wildlife rescue certificates at the moment. So <laughs> probably wow. next time you'll see me, I'll have a little wombat to take care of, or as my partner says, you, you wish we, uh, we, we end up with a baby wombat, but we're probably going <laughs> to a teenage emu or something kind of scary. 
Um, more destructive, a little more destructive than a, a wombat. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, so this is, you know, the, the wildlife rescue is really um, uh, in a lot of people's minds here. Right. Of course, the whale cannot be saved in captivity. The whale needs to be saved in the wild. And I think this is the big change, you know, from what the 1980s environmental movement strived to use the whale for and what we're, um, what it is possible to use the whale for now. So in the 80s, you know, it really was this icon of green devotion and it brought together this like global citizenry who'd never really you know, some of them not on coastlines, some people living in urban environments in high rise buildings, whose um, idea of a whale and its magic really hinged on actually how remote it was, um, but nonetheless felt moved to get up and march for the whale and be kind of active on its behalf. Right. Now, of course, they were agitating against whaling governments and whaling fleets. Mm -hmm. But to be for saving the whale now means to be knitted together into this system of worldliness that's so much greater because it means being you know to be active on the subject of plastic pollution to be active on the subject of climate change um these are the environmental threats that pose a risk to populations of whales today and i think that that's really you know the great power of the animal to us at least is that it augments our moral capacity because in coming years we're going to be asked to care for things that are very remote, you know, be it future generations or people living on the equator or animal populations far from human habitation. And if we're constantly thinking like we can only act on behalf of things that we've met, that we know, then we're going to lose a lot of the life that makes our own emotional palette so rich because our suffering is linked to the depletion of the natural world. It's, you know, I, I I would like to call on everyone kind of benevolence, but ultimately I think selfishly, um, you know, we when we lose animal populations, we lose something that is, you know, critical to our own palette of experience. Um, yeah. And yeah, so um, I think that part of the project of writing this book and your book as well, and, and what you do more broadly, is that kind of re-enchantment with distant wildness and kind of sovereign nature outside of human habitation. Um, we need that. We need that even if we live in cities. Right. There are other nations. Uh, that's that's a, a line from uh, Henry Beston's Outer, Outermost House. Uh, in a world older and more complete than ours, they move finished and complete, gifted with senses that we have lost or never attained, living by mm -hmm. voices we shall never hear. Or in some cases with whales, we actually do hear their voices, but we still don't know what they say. Uh, they're not brethren, they're not underlings, they're other nations caught with ourselves in the net of life and time. So, you know, I think enchantment with the wildness is, um, you know, that goes back to the ways of knowing uh, that you write so powerfully about. And, you know, I'm just, I was thinking you weave together in your book those, those ways of knowing whether, um, you know, whether they're in a museum, you talk about walking with your sister through, is it in West, is it, uh, is it in Western Australia at the, at the yeah, Museum in right. Perth? Yeah. Um, yep. You know, walking down uh, the staircase, looking at a whale skeleton and kind of mm -hmm. transport the readers through that, but braiding it with the lives of stranded whales, the suffering that we see, the numbers of plastic bags that end up with them. So, you know, life in the Anthropocene is, is about, I mean, at least, um, I think you, you were kind of asking me how much this resonates. Um, for me, it's about being a, a good ancestor is that we, I, I'm a bit biased, but I think uh, you can make the argument that this is a great time to be alive. Um, we really are at a junction when we understand our imprint on the natural world. You can't deny that. Mm -hmm. And if you at all have a moral conscience, uh, suffering is linked to that. And, uh, you know, this is acute, if you're in Australia, how many billions of animal lives were killed in the wildfires? I mean, untold numbers. Yeah. Um, and whether, whether you think that there's a, a scala natura for, for bugs or mammals, uh, if you just cut it at mammals, that's still a lot of, of um, mammal life that has perished. And we, we are at the, it's not a unique event. That was not a cataclysm that, could not have been predicted, right? And so 
um, we have only more and more knowledge, I guess the question is, are we gonna use that to empower ourselves as good ancestors to have an ethic that is expansive? And, and I guess that enchantment ha necessarily, if you're gonna be enchanted by whales, um, it has to be uh, removed. You have to undergo this journey of the imagination. You may be so lucky to experience a whale up close, living or cast on the beach, but um, if not, studying them, knowing about them, and I, you know, I just, you know, I think it's not just what scientists say; it's what anybody can glean and what anybody feels like they can know um, that tell us about lives outside of our own, right? Because um, whales are out there living lives. Um, in, in ways that we are only beginning to understand and know, um, far removed from our lives in cities and um, in other places. Um, I, you know, I noticed we're coming up on, on time here. Um, is there anything that, that you wanna share about maybe what you're working on uh, next? You kind of hinted at this yeah. in our correspondence. <laughs> um, well, maybe I'll just finish by kind of putting a capstone on that, what you've just said so eloquently. Um, which is that, as you were speaking just then, I was thinking of a quote from Sherwood Rowland, the scientist who worked on the ozone layer. He said something once like, um, what is the point of developing a science that is capable of making really accurate predictions if all we're willing to do is stand around and watch and wait for them to come true? And I, I do think that there's a sense in which, you know, even as we're discovering more and more every day, there are animals with cognitive abilities that match ours, that have equally complex cultures that are, you know, of in and of themselves, the other nations. The one thing that we do seem to have that is unique is an ability to forecast the future and not just to adapt to current conditions, but to change our behavior in line with that vision of the future. And knowing that about ourselves, I think that should give us even more impetus to act because we are the future yeah. imagining animal. What I'm working on next, oh look, at the moment, it's like a wall of post-it notes. I'm just building myself into a cave of ideas. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, I'm initially, I'm doing some work on pets at the moment. Oh, cool. Um, uh, and yeah, a, a kind of mirror to fathoms to some extent because they are the most proximate animal as opposed to mm. the most distant yeah. and very different emotional state attaches to pets. You know, it's all about affection rather than awe and wonder. Um, but I'm just beginning to feel my way into that topic. Um, uh, yeah, and doing some other bits and pieces of freelance work at the moment. But you have a children's book out. I know we've got just one more minute, but tell yeah. us about the kids' book before we have to say uh, it's a, it's a spin-off of a chapter in Spying on Whales that I co-wrote with the illustrator of Spying on Whales, mm -hmm. uh, Alex Borsma. And so it's a kids' book. It'll be out next year. It's all about a bowhead whale that lives centuries and the worlds that it experiences that change in front of it for both itself and its its genealogy. So uh, you know, it gets, it's really whales telling us about worlds um, beyond us. And it's a book about climate change. It's about the future um, uh, because the world that a whale born today in the Arctic will experience is unlike any of its ancestors mm -hmm. since that lineage started three million years ago. So um, that's, a, that's a captivating premise and, you know, the challenge is to write something compelling with it. Mm. Um, do you have a cover image for it or do you have a, a mock I do not, not with me, but, um, but um, we'll, we'll share it soon on, on social media. It's uh, Alex Borsman is doing um, watercolor and, and uh, other media, not just the lino cut that you see in black and white in the book, it's a different style. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's telling the story of, a, of many generations from the perspective of the whale uh, herself. So, um, you know, Let me just show you before we sign off. I'll show you the paperback cover for. Oh um, yeah, because um, the hardback has been out for a little while now. Sorry. And that's that. the U.S. That's available. That's, that's the U.S. cover. Right? Yeah. So if people are trying Fantastic. to find it in the store, it's this sort of glossy blue cover now. Um, yeah. So I'm excited to. These just arrived yesterday. So. I'm oh, that's excited. that is one of the great things. Uh, you know, and there's I have a, a soft version of the hardback, oh, which has which I call the Wonder Woman, you know, 1984 cover because it's got like all that you know kind of hollywood gloss uh you know congratulations on on the success with that book and, and the awards that it's in the acclaim that's garnered rebecca and it's great to chat with you i think um i'm under obligation unfortunately to wrap things up 
And I want to thank Rebecca, who's um, coming to us from a half a world away, and uh, to read more of her book. Uh, and um, and I also want to thank um, uh, the organizers of the Virginia Festival of the Book, uh, who are over at vabook.org, and uh, to check out any future virtual events that they may be holding. Um, otherwise, I think, oh, there's one more, I see one more Q&A. Uh, I think we have time. I'm going to wait until the, the, you know, the hook comes over. Uh, Jordan Taylor, whales have such a rich literary and scientific tradition, but you have, have you ever encountered work of art and other medium that conveys the expansive sense you both find in whales? Mm. Music, oh, that's, art, that's you know. Um, I'm, I love museum artifacts, like as a form of sculpture, like the, the, um, osteology the the amazing skeletons but also there are some fantastic fiberglass versions of whales in um uh a museum in Weno Park in uh Japan um and also in the Natural History Museum in London um and then just whale songs recordings of whale songs really I find bewitching um and I often sort of play that in the background when I'm working just to have this presence of some other kind of intelligence in the space yeah. um yeah youtube is great that way isn't it um <laughs> I, I like your plug for i'm a little biased as a museum curator I, I love the plug for museums and what i'd say is um you know support those museums uh, wherever they are um whether they're museums of culture or natural history those are the places that carry knowledge forward that preserve it um outside of our our lives uh, and help inform future generations. That's part of being a good ancestor. So that's that would be my my plug. Um, and we just don't know, do we? I mean, I feel like what we're discovering now in terms of the technological ability to look at these old bones, yeah. extract new information, just these archives of natural specimens, what's gonna come online in 10 years time, 20 years time, the genetic technology, we're gonna have, th there's, People can think we're just keeping these dusty bones as a kind of, you know, tabula rasa yeah. for life that's in these drawers. And but actually, what they're going to unfold in the future will be miraculous. So um, yeah, I, I agree absolutely. Support your local museums. Yeah, I uh, the way I think of it is natural history museums in particular save the world. Uh, and our the director of my museum has a bumper sticker in his office that says that. And it sounds saccharine, but it actually is. Um, you can read it literally, you know, parts of worlds that go back in geologic time are saved in museums. And we want to know about them because the people who founded museums could not know how important museums are right now today, as we're losing parts of the world, as parts of the world are changing. So if you want to know what the next few generations, decades, centuries are going to look like, we're going to need museums moving forward as much as we need scientists participating in, um, you know, um, decision-making processes as much as we need an informed electorate too. So um, that's why I think you can't go wrong writing kids' books because they will uh, end up being future voters. So if you can help inspire wonder, um, and there's lots of ways to inspire wonder. So um, that's... Uh, Thank you so much. This sure, no problem. So we'll have to I talk know. more. So much to think about. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I, it's been such a pleasure to make this happen and in front of an audience as well. I think um, we would have had a great conversation no matter I know, what. But I know, I, I know. With this, with the I know. Of book, I'm really happy. Thanks so much. Um, I think I'm, uh, I think it's on me to sign off. I, I, I've already kind of given my sign off and we're just kind of like um, newscaster banter here right now, but um, <laughs> I'm waiting for them to, to, to cancel, but we're, I think we're at time at an hour. So um, uh, yes, I can just say bye now. So that's what I'll say. I'll say bye now. Thank you. And there will be a recording uh, over at uh, the Virginia Festival of the Book and the fine people who have organized that. Thanks so much. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.